It's a great, great pleasure to welcome this wonderful audience to the 2009 Beattie Memorial Lecture. Uh, this is a remarkable, truly remarkable homecoming weekend at uh, McGill, and uh, this is one of the delights of this weekend. Chers diplômés, chers étudiantes et étudiants, et chers amis, il me fait plaisir de vous accueillir à cette série de conférences publiques très attendues. It's, uh, it's wonderful to have so many alumni here on campus for this celebratory weekend. One of the themes that has emerged over these last few days is that of global health in a molecular age and the difficulties of applying in public health the remarkable discoveries since World War II and discovering that superstition is so strong and that in weeks time with the internet, with the new media, North America can decide that vaccination against H1N1 uh, is dangerous, is more dangerous than the disease itself, and deny a life-saving, sustaining therapy to children. So, so much to be done in a time in which, in this century of biology, uh, we will move further and faster than could have been imagined at any prior age. Each year at McGill, we invite a renowned scientist to deliver the Beattie Memorial Lecture to inspire us and engage the public in thoughtful discourse on topics of note. In 1952, Henry Beattie established the Beattie Memorial Lecture Series at McGill with a gift of $100,000 in memory of his brother, Edward Wentworth Beatty. Edward Beatty, educated in law at the University of Toronto, began his career as the Canadian Pacific Railway in 1901. And from 1918 until 1943, he served as CPR president, leading the company through a period of dramatic growth. Well established in Montreal, Beatty served as Chancellor of McGill University and Chair of the Board of Governors from 1920 until 1943. And for his significant contributions to Canadian industry and to higher education, Beatty was honored in 1935 as Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the British Empire. And it's with immense pride that we continue the tradition of outstanding achievement at McGill Inspired by Sir Edward Beatty, we are committed with this series of lectures to provoke our students of every age, as well as students from the very broad community, this, this knowledge community of Montreal, to learn and to think deeply about the challenging issues of today. I want to take a few moments to acknowledge key parties involved in bringing this year's Beattie Memorial Lecture to life. My colleague, Denny Terrian, Vice Principal of Research and International Relations and his team, the McGill Alumni Association, the Beattie Memorial Lecturers Committee, and the Montreal Neurological Institute and Hospital, that is the neuro. Uh, thank you all for orchestrating this event and for giving us this uh, wonderful excuse to come together uh, this morning. Uh, it's my distinct uh, pleasure now to introduce a member of my faculty, the 16th Principal and Vice Chancellor of McGill University, Professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, a scientist, educator, and leader of the McGill, indeed the world uh, educational community. Professor Munro Bloom is known in Canada and internationally for her dedication to the advancement of higher education, science, and innovation and we are very fortunate to count her among our leadership ranks. Madam Principal. Oh. 
Bonjour et bienvenue, uh, chers étudiants, uh, parents, collègues, invités distingués. C'est vraiment une joie ce matin d'avoir cette uh, uh, BD lecture, uh, cette uh, une, uh, série de distinctions et uh, de fierté pour McGill. And uh, what a great uh, week this has been uh, at McGill, and what a wonderful time uh, to welcome all of you here this morning for as uh, Dr. Levin said, a highlight of our, of our week, a highlight of our homecoming series um, to uh, our BD lecture. And I want to just say a, a few words, uh, Dr. Levin, about you. And uh, for those of you who are not from inside the McGill community day in and day out, we have over the last eight years recruited 900 exceptional uh, new professors to McGill University from everywhere in the world, uh, each one recruited on the basis of a, uh, a very uh, competitive international search. And uh, these have added to uh, uh, approximately 700 uh, professors here at the university to create a uh, most distinguished uh, group of teachers, scholars, researchers. And for those of us who uh, claim to be part of uh, uh, the leadership of the university. Uh, it's been just a remarkable honor for me to uh, welcome a number of those recruits and a number of our uh, professors of long standing into the senior ranks. And uh, Dean Levin, uh, I can think of no one more than you who has added luster to the university and leadership to uh, our faculty of medicine uh, uh, than you. Uh, McGill University was founded almost 200 years ago on a college of medicine, and the uh, faculty of medicine, the allied health disciplines, and our uh, very distinguished affiliated teaching hospitals make up approximately 50% of the uh, intellectual work and teaching uh, of the university, and which you've just given stunning leadership in that regard. Thank you for that. I'd like to recognize as well in this very important weekend our new Chancellor, uh, Arnold Steinberg. Would you please stand and be recognized? Uh, Arnold Steinberg is a uh, wonderful alumnus of McGill, a distinguished Canadian businessman, a volunteer uh, par excellence. He is uh, chair of the uh, Council of the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. He is, as well, uh, chair of Canada Health Infoway, the largest corporation integrating health information for patient care. And you see in the leadership of both of these people and our stunning uh, director of the Montreal Neurological Institute, Dr. David Coleman, who will speak to you later on, uh, leadership in one of the most important domains for uh, civil society, for public health, for the good of of uh, uh, Canadians and indeed people around the world. That is the whole area of health, everything that goes into it. Uh, we couldn't be better served than we are at McGill and Arnold to have you now as our chancellor. And I wanna, I wanna say that uh, Mr. Steinberg presided over one of the uh, very exciting convocation uh, ceremonies uh, that we've had at McGill yesterday in uh, uh, conferring on uh, President Bill Clinton an honorary degree, and he did this even prior to being installed uh, as Chancellor formally, which will happen in November, and did it uh, just with such grace and aplomb. Arnold, we're so proud of you. Um, I want to uh, welcome as well the members of the Board of uh, Governors, our Governors Emeriti, uh, parents, uh, dear colleagues, and especially students who are present here uh, today. Uh, you're in for a real treat. Homecoming weekend is always one of the great events in the life of McGill, and this year's festivities are especially exciting. Uh, in addition to welcoming literally thousands of alumni back to our campuses, uh, the, our downtown campus and our great uh, West Island McDonald uh, campus, this is also the third annual Parents Weekend. Um, and uh, as a, as a uh, parent of a daughter who went off to school uh, in the United States uh, five years ago, I wondered, I, I, I personally uh, experienced the brilliance of having a parents weekend. Uh, for those of you who are a parent or for those of you who are first year students, 
when your children, your young adults, go off to university in those early months, there are pangs. Uh, you want to reach out to them, but you know how important their independence is. And for you as uh, a students going away from home, uh, perhaps for the first time, you think about home and you may even want to see your family, but you don't want to call them. And so when I got this invitation from the University of Chicago uh, to come for Parents Weekend, I thought, voila, what a brilliant idea. The university is forcing the parents to come to campus. Um, uh, the students are forced to see their parents. Um, but there's this great intellectual uh, environment around you that draws the parents away from their, their, uh, their students, but close enough to them. And, uh, there are midterm exams that students are attending to, but that allow you to have breakfast or come to a BD lecture uh, or do something else with your parents, and it's just a wonderful uh, happening. So one of the perks of being, uh, being principal is I can have great ideas, but then I have these magnificent colleagues who, who implement them, and I, I want to say thank you to the team who have made our Parents Weekend, I think, amongst the best in North America. And this homecoming uh, and parents weekend was preceded by our first ever leadership summit. Indeed, the conferring of the honorary degree on Bill Clinton was the culmination of that, but it brought uh, over 400 of our top volunteers from countries spanning five continents back to our McGill uh, campus to participate in uh, intellectual and social activities here and uh, to celebrate indeed the halfway mark in the public phase of our uh, McGill campaign, uh, which I'm happy to say is uh, notwithstanding an economic downturn, overshooting our target for this point. We just passed the $500 million mark in our campaign. <laughs> and while money is but a means to an end, uh, it is of course uh, deeply important in a public university like McGill uh, where we have, uh, I hope here that I'm not doing something terrible to, I clearly am. And I'm, I'm ill-equipped to speak to this slide, so. <laughs> Mark, I hope you'll forgive me, and I hope you'll all, I'm gonna just go very quickly now <laughs> through this. <laughs> um, uh, it's great art, and it'll become something more substantial momentarily. Um, in any event, it's been a most exciting time, and I can't think of a, a better way to come into this weekend than to uh, have a uh, distinguished son of McGill, our alumnus, Mark Tessier-Levine, come and be our uh, distinguished BD lecture, uh, lecturer for today. Uh, let me say that I had the pleasure of meeting Mark in California some years back, where he is uh, leading in a wonderful role uh, in science, which I'll describe briefly, but we're also say, uh, happy to say that in addition to being a son of McGill, uh, Dr. Tessier Levine is a son of Canada, and he has, notwithstanding becoming uh, an American citizen as well, retained his Canadian uh, citizenship. He was born in Trenton, Ontario, and uh, completed a degree in physics at McGill in 1980. He then went on to study philosophy and physiology as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University before completing a PhD at the University of London. He has served as a professor at the University of California, San Francisco, and Stanford University, and was also an investigator with the distinguished Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, for those of us who have uh, come to know him some, it's clear that from a very early age he was destined for great things. And uh, Mark is the kind of polymath uh, who could have chosen any one of 20 different directions in a career and succeeded at any of them, but he's chosen instead to de dedicate himself to a life of science, uh, discovery, uh, making sure that discoveries get out to uh, where they can have an impact in improving uh, public health and well-being. And his area of specialty is in the study of brain development and regeneration. His pioneering work in the field has led to the identification of molecules, maybe this is one of them, <laughs> that direct the formation of connections among nerve cells, which establish neuronal circuits in the brain and spinal cord uh, during embryonic development. Today at Genentech, an exceptional company, Dr. Tessier-Levine has a team of more than 1,300 people 
all of whom are involved in disease uh, research and drug discovery for cancer, immune disorders, infectious disease, neurology and tissue growth and repair. Dr. Tessier Levine is a member of numerous scientific uh, editorial advisory boards, including the Board of Reviewers for the Distinguished Science uh, magazine. Uh, one of the things that um, has touched me particularly since meeting Mark is that while he works in industry, he works for a company that in many respects feels like a university. And I have the feeling that it's Dr. Tessier Levine's personal leadership that has created um, a very nurturing and generative environment that allows young people to come and explore their talents, uh, pursue them, and have their own successes. He's a remarkable teacher. And for all of us, we've been touched by a teacher who has allowed us to see in ourselves um, something powerful that we wouldn't otherwise have seen, who's helped us rethink our pathway in life uh, to think about new directions. And Mark, I think you do that every time you interact with people old and uh, young. And uh, our students yesterday had that gift of interacting with him and being touched by him. Uh, in addition to his commitment to, uh, to teaching, he's authored more than 100 articles. And his scientific achievements have earned him numerous awards and honors, including uh, being named a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a fellow of the United Kingdom's Academy of Medical Sciences, and a member of the US National Academy of Sciences. Words easily spoken, but uh, positions and honors not easily achieved. Dr. Eric Kendall, Nobel Prize winner in medicine uh, and professor at Columbia University, calls Dr. Tessier Levine the best that science can produce, and we would certainly agree with that. We're most fortunate that he's uh, um, come here today to be our 2009 BD lecture, and uh, uh, I want to say that the fact that he's coming, uh, literally as we're approaching the 75th anniversary of our Montreal Neurological Institute, uh, now known the Neuro and its integration with the Neurological Hospital as we uh, embark on in the coming months celebration of the uh, the neuro, uh, what better time to welcome this distinguished son of McGill back to McGill, Mark Tessier Levine. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Monroe Bloom, for that very, very kind introduction and also for that wonderful preview of my slides. <laughs> C'est pour moi un très grand plaisir d'être ici aujourd'hui parmi vous. I, it's a great honor for me to have been invited to give the BD Memorial Lecture. Um, and it's an honor I'm particularly grateful for, as it's allowed me to come back and see so many old friends and make some new ones as well. Uh, and also uh, to be able to, to witness and admire uh, the uh, remarkable progress um, that the university has made uh, under your leadership. So thank you very much. Now, as Dr. Monroe Bloom told you, uh, we've been interested in how the brain gets wired up during embryonic development. The brain, of course, is the most complex organ in our bodies. Uh, it is the seat of perception, emotions, uh, of consciousness. It makes us who we are. The complexity of the brain is evident um, in just the sheer number of the elemental building blocks of the brain, the nerve cells or neurons, I'll show you a picture of a neuron in just a few minutes, uh, that make up the brain. There are about a trillion nerve cells, neurons uh, in the brain. And each of these nerve cells has to connect to other nerve cells to form the electrical circuits that underlie perception and behavior. We think of the brain as a computer, um, but it's more complex, uh, more powerful, more sophisticated than any computer uh, that's been made uh, by man. And uh, even more remarkable, it's a self-wiring computer. It's one that assembles itself all by itself during embryonic development. To me, that's nothing short of wondrous. This slide here illustrates the uh, development of the brain from conception in the upper left-hand corner uh, through to term. And I think you can see the problem that in just nine months, the embryonic brain, which starts out the size of a pinhead up here, um, has to under, and it contains at that stage just about a few hundred nerve cells or neurons, has to undergo a period of explosive growth 
that results in the generation of close to a trillion nerve cells um, or neurons, as you can see. Now, it's not just a question of making a trillion nerve cells. The right kinds of nerve cells have to be made at the right times, at the right places in the brain, um, and uh, in the right numbers, so that, for example, nerve cells that are involved in perceiving light and converting light into an electrical signal are found only in the neural tissue at the back of your eye, the retina. They're not found in the brain where they would be of no use. Even more daunting, each of these nerve cells then has to make connections with the appropriate target cells to form these neural circuits, and they have to make these connections through the thicket of um, other uh, nerve cells that are present in the brain. Now, these connections are formed when each neuron, uh, as it's born, sends out a thin cable-like structure called uh, the axon. The axon is actually an electrical cable. In the adult nervous system, it will conduct electrical impulses, and it's the, the, this electricity, these electrical impulses, that form the basis of information transfer within the brain. In the embryo, the challenge that the uh, developing neuron faces is that its axon has to grow often over quite long distances to find just the right targets with which to form uh, connections. And what's remarkable about the growth of axons is that it's highly directed. Individual axons follow very stereotyped trajectories in the embryo and make very few errors of projection. And the way, um, so if you look, for example, in experimental animals, let's say in experimental rats, at a particular cluster of nerve cells, you'll find that from one animal to the next to the next, all of the axons start growing at the same time in the same direction and make it, make a, a beeline to their target. Now, the way this works is that at the tip of the developing axon, uh, there's a specialized structure called the growth cone. This is a motile structure, it can motor along. It's also a sensory structure. It, can, it seeks out information in the environment using these finger-like extensions. It's constantly searching for guidance information, cues, proteins that will tell it where to go. So you can think of the growth cone, if you will, a little bit like a dog on a leash um, that is sniffing out the environment, sniffing out guidance information, uh, and that will uh, respond to that information with um, directed growth, leading the axon in its wake. I just want to show you a movie of one of these growth cones moving forward. This was made by a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory, Le Ma. What he's done is to take out uh, neurons from an embryonic rat and place them in the rarefied environment of a petri dish, a cell culture environment, where he can watch uh, individual growth cones. And as you saw, the growth cone has moved along. Let me show you the movie once more. It's a, uh, accelerated about 250 times. You can see this protrusive activity of the growth cone as these finger-like extensions extend in search of guidance information um, and uh, as the growth cone moves forward and carries the axon in its wake. So a challenge for our field has been to identify the guidance cues, the proteins, that instruct the growth cone to migrate in particular directions and understand how they guide growth cones. Now, the first speculations on this subject were made by the great uh, neuroembryologist Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who discovered the growth cone uh, in 1893 and immediately proposed his chemotropic or chemotactic theory, according to which growth cones would be guided by chemoattractive substances made by the targets that would diffuse through the environment and attract the axons at a distance. Now, Cajal uh, proposed this theory. He was inspired at the time uh, by the then recent discovery of um, uh, chemotaxis, as I'm sure you all remember, in the late 1880s, uh, it was a time of intense ferment. Uh, uh, the chemotaxis of white blood cells had just been discovered. White blood cells will chemotax to areas of infection. They accumulate, and that's, how they, that what, that's what forms the pus around a, an infection. And it was discovered that the white blood cells home to the targets because of chemoattractive substances. Cajal uh, imagined that the growth cone was a little bit like a white, white blood cell on a leash. Um, or to go back to the dog on a leash analogy, the idea is that the target makes uh, scents or perfumes that the dog can sense at a distance and that attract it to the target. Now, this idea that there would be chemoattractants guiding axons actually lay dormant for the better part of a century until about 20 years ago when several laboratories, including ours, uh, obtained experimental support for the theory. And um, the way we and others did this um, was conceptually quite, quite simple but experimentally challenging. Um, what we did was to take out clusters of nerve cells uh, from embryonic uh, organisms like rats or chickens and place them in cell culture, as I showed you in the previous slide, allowing the axons to grow out. And we simply confronted them with various tissues, control tissues or microdissected pieces of the target. And what was found 
is that axons would actually turn towards the target at a distance in these rarefied culture experiments. And that showed that the target cells had to be making something, a chemoattractive substance, that the axons were detecting at a distance, showing that there are chemoattractants, although not yet identifying them at the molecular level. So experiments like these show that Cajal uh, is right, or was right. But it turns out he was only half right, because similar types of experiments showed that axons are guided not just by chemoattractants, but also by the opposite type of mechanism, by chemorepellent substances. These are made by non-target cells. They diffuse through the environment and create exclusion zones that steer axons away from regions that they should avoid. So if you go back to the dog on a leash analogy, you can think of these chemorepellents as bad smells or malodors um, that the dog avoids. Although as I was thinking through this analogy last night, um, I thought we have two dogs and I've never known them to avoid any odor, uh, <laughs> however foul. Um, and so I guess what this shows is that growth cones are more discriminating than our dogs. Now, at the, about the time that uh, we were uh, identifying um, uh, these types of mechanisms, interest was also mounting in the related process of axonal branching, which is illustrated um, here. As many of you know, um, nerve cells typically make connections not with just one target cell, but with multiple target cells. In the cortex, the, the top of the brain, uh, neurons on average make connections with about 100 target cells. And the way they do this is by sprouting secondary growth cones off the axon shaft. And what was found is that the, this process of axonal branching, like the process of axon growth, is also highly stereotyped. If you look from one animal to the next to the next, you see that the nerve cells will make branches at exactly the same times on the same locations on the axon shaft and project in the same direction. And so it should come as no surprise to you that there are intricate mechanisms to ensure that the branches are formed at the right times, right places. And there are positive regulators of branching uh, that I've illustrated here in blue that stimulate the formation of branches and attract the axons. There are also negative regulators of branching, which I haven't illustrated, uh, that will uh, ensure that branches don't form in inappropriate locations uh, like here. So this is where we stood about 15 years ago. We knew that there were attractive, repulsive, and branch regulating activities that helped wire the nervous system but none of the molecular mediators, none of the proteins that mediate these effects were known. So what I'd like to do today um, is really to divide my talk into three parts. And in the first part, I'd like to uh, bring you up to date on what we and others have discovered about the identity of the molecules that mediate attraction, repulsion, and branching of these axons. And then um, I'd like to address a, a particular challenge that faces many neurons, um, which is the problem of accurate long-range guidance. And just to bring this to life a little bit, uh, think of neurons that are involved in controlling uh, movement, for example, the movement of my hand. There are nerve cells in the cortex, which is where the command uh, originates, that have cell bodies up there at the top of the brain. They have to send axons all the way down through the brain into the spinal cord, which is the extension of the brain into the vertebral column, a tube-like structure, down to other nerve cells at the level of my arms, and there they will connect to those nerve cells. Those nerve cells, in turn, will send their axons all the way out to my fingers and hands. So it's a two-nerve cell circuit, and you can see just how long the axons have to be. So how can axons be guided uh, unerringly over such long distances? You could say, well, why don't you just put a chemoattractant at the base in the spinal cord, and the problem is, that the distances are too great. These chemoattractants can only diffuse over distances of perhaps half a millimeter. Not bad for a small embryonic tissue, but you know, not enough to explain that long-range guidance. So how do axons affect these long-range navigational feats? I'd like to describe that. And then I'd like to conclude by discussing how this information about how the growth of axons is controlled has helped provide some insights that may be relevant to the problem of repair of the nervous system after injury. Following a spinal cord injury, uh, like the one that was uh, suffered by Christopher Reeve, for example, what happens is that the axons that connect the brain to the spinal cord are severed, they're cut. And so the circuits are disconnected, which is why um, uh, Christopher Reeve was paralyzed. And the axons do not regrow to reconnect, and what the question, which is why the paralysis is often permanent, and uh, what we'd like to address is whether the, any of the insights that we've obtained into how uh, axons grow in the first place in the embryo can be used to help encourage the regrowth of axons after injury to try to overcome that paralysis. 
So let's start uh, with the identification of molecules that uh, direct attraction, repulsion, and branching. Uh, the approach that we took to this problem was to take advantage of these cell culture assays that we set up that I described in which nerve cells are cultured together with their target cells and turned towards the source and to try to use those to pinpoint the, the molecules that are responsible for um, this activity. And the, the first system in which we decided to try to do this was um, in the developing spinal cord, which I'm going to introduce in more detail now. Again, the spinal cord is this tube-like extension of the brain into the vertebral column. Uh, this is what it looks like in cross-section uh, in uh, the developing embryo. It has a pear-like structure. And we're going to focus uh, in particular on one class of nerve cells, uh, so-called commissural uh, neurons, that have cell bodies in the top half of the spinal cord. These neurons send their axons along a very stereo stereotype trajectory that leads them from the top of the spinal cord down to the bottom. And we um, obtained evidence that um, there was a chemoattractant made by cells at the bottom that could function to attract these axons. The cells at the bottom are uh, called floor plate cells because, they're made, um, because they are located at the floor of the spinal cord. And the way we showed that these floor plate cells make a chemoattractive substance was exactly as I described previously. We took out pieces of the top of the spinal cord from embryonic rats and placed them in culture on their side, as you can see here. And we culture them either alone with control tissues or with microdissected pieces of these yellow floor plate cells, as you can see here. And I think you can appreciate that these floor plate cells, but not other tissues, could stimulate the profuse and directed outgrowth of these commissural axons from these pieces of uh, spinal cord. And it's experiments like this uh, that are what I was referring to earlier, in which the target was shown to attract the axons in vitro, showing that there is a substance made by these floor plate cells that can attract the axons. So now we wanted to get our hands on the substance. And the way we did this was to use the tools of uh, biochemistry and biochemical purification. I don't want to go through all the details, but I do want to give you an idea of how we went about this. Um, we first looked for a, um, an abundant source of this activity. The floor plate's a pretty tiny structure, but fortunately we found that there was a similar chemoattractive activity present in extracts of embryonic brain, which is a much more abundant source. And we could use that um, uh, 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 source of material to try to purify the activity um, as follows. In the, the starting extract, it's a very a heterogeneous mixture of thousands of proteins. And what we're trying to do is to pinpoint the one protein that's responsible for this effect. And the way you go about doing this is actually quite simple. You divide all of the proteins in, uh, according to various physical characteristics. So we can divide them into the big proteins and the small proteins, and then test both batches. We found that the activity was uh, somewhere among the big proteins. So we threw away the small proteins and continued. Then we divided the proteins into those that are positively charged and those that are negatively charged. We found that our protein was positively charged. Then we subdivided further and further and further until we came down to the one protein that was responsible for this. And this is what it looks like to a biochemist. What you can do is you can, at various stages of the purification of the proteins, you can take the proteins and separate them. So you can see we started with hundreds upon hundreds of proteins, and we ended up with a single protein that could uh, mimic the effect of the floor plate tissue. And um, it turns out in the starting material, this was uh, a very rare protein, so we actually had to start with a lot of material um, in order to get enough at the end uh, for our purposes. In fact, we had to micro-dissect 25,000 embryonic chick brains in order to get enough material to go forward. Once we had the protein, uh, first we named it. Uh, you have naming rights in biology. Um, and so we called it uh, netrin-1 from a Sanskrit word, netter, meaning one who guides. And then we were able to take advantage of the tools and tricks of molecular biology. Once you have a protein like this, it's actually pretty straightforward to go from the protein to get the genetic code that codes for that protein. I think you all know that DNA uh, encodes proteins, that different bits of the DNA in your genome code for the different proteins in your body. So we were able to identify the DNA sequence. And once you have that, you're home free. Because once you have that, you can do lots of things like make a lot of the protein in a test tube using that genetic code so that you don't have to purify it from 25,000 embryonic chick brains anymore. You can also make various probes so that you can see the protein, both um, in uh, biochemical assays like this, but also directly in the tissue. And let me just show you what this looks like. 
we, we asked once we had this, what's the distribution of the Netrin-1 protein in the spinal cord? And so we used, we developed a purple probe which, that makes uh, the Netrin protein look purple, and sure enough, this is now the spinal cord of an embryonic rat. You can see that the Netrin-1 protein is expressed at very high levels. It's made at high levels here in these floor plate cells, and it diffuses through the spinal cord, creating a gradient. And our model then is that this gradient of Netrin protein is functioning to attract the axons to the midline. So that was our hypothesis. And what I'd like to do is to describe two experiments we did to uh, verify that hypothesis. Uh, if this theory is correct, that the axons are growing there because they're attracted by netrin, we make two predictions. And the first is this, that if we put netrin somewhere else, let's say here, that the axons should turn towards the source. So let's do that experiment. Um, the way we went about doing that was taking advantage of the chicken embryo, where you can take a fertilized egg, allow the embryo to grow, you cut a window in the eggshell, and you can actually go in and look at the embryo and microscopically, with a very small needle, insert a little bit of uh, netrin protein here or a, an inert control substance and ask what happens to the axons. Again, our prediction is that the axons should turn towards the source. Let me show you what this looks like. Um, here you see a cross-section through a chicken embryo that had been operated in this way, but where in the middle of the spinal cord we injected an inert substance. And this is just a control experiment. Uh, it also shows you how we visualize the trajectory of these axons. Up till now, I've shown you cartoons of the spinal cord. This is now the, the chicken spinal cord, uh, slightly different shape from the spinal cord of the rat, which I showed you in the previous slide. We can visualize the axons by putting a little bit of a red dye here that diffuses down the axons, and it reveals this beautiful trajectory down to the normal source of netrin protein. But now the experiment is to introduce a bit of netrin protein here, and sure enough, when we do this, we find that the axons no longer project to the bottom of the spinal cord. Instead, they turn towards the source. So this shows that netrin protein can attract axons not just in a, in a um, petri dish, but also in the living uh, uh, embryo, in the living spinal cord. What about the opposite manipulation? Um, uh, 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 this shows you that netrin can attract axons, but is it actually required for the normal growth of the axons to um, uh, the, the bottom of the spinal cord here. Um, to address this, what we wanted to do was to take away the netrin protein here and ask what happens to the axons. Do they get misrouted? Do they make errors of projection? And there's a way of doing this. I think uh, many of you are familiar with this. It, uh, and it's based on having the genetic sequence of uh, the, the protein of netrin-1. You can actually uh, make engineer mice that lack that genetic sequence. They're so-called knockout mice. So we made a mouse that lacks the genetic information to make netrin protein. So this mouse no longer can make netrin protein, and we can ask what happens to the axons. And this is shown here. So now we're looking at a cross-section through the spinal cord of a normal mouse embryo. Um, again, a slightly different shape of the spinal cord. Here we're visualizing the axons with a different red dye uh, that actually labels all of the axons on both sides of the spinal cord. You can see this beautiful trajectory to the source of netrin protein. So now let's look in the mouse that lacks the netrin protein because essentially we've, we've deleted the genetic uh, information from its genome. What we see is this, that the axons start out in the right trajectory, so other, something else is guiding them at the beginning, but then they get very confused. Very few of them, as you can see, make it down to um, the, the bottom of the spinal cord. Many of them project towards the middle, others towards the side. And these data then show that netrin is required to get the axons to the bottom of the spinal cord. So these two experiments together show that netrin is, can attract axons in the living organism and is necessary for their normal uh, trajectory. So our theory then that netrin guides the axons to the bottom of the spinal cord was verified in this way. Now this actually then led us to two uh, remarkable surprises. Um, and the first was that at the very same time as we were identifying netrin and showing that it guides axons to the bottom of the spinal cord, um, our uh, uh, other scientists in the field, Ed Hedgecock, Joe Colotti, and their colleagues, were studying an analogous set of neurons in a very primitive organism, the roundworm, a roundworm called a C. elegans. Uh, they were studying a set of nerve cells in the top of the worm that send axons to the bottom of the worm. And using the tricks of worm genetics, they were able to identify a protein 
um, which they showed functions to attract the axons to the bottom of the worm. And when they identified this protein, which they called UNC6, it turned out that it was a close relative of the netrin protein. For those of you who uh, know about proteins, you probably know that uh, a protein is defined by a sequence of building blocks called amino acids. And, and a way of comparing the relationship of proteins is to look at the percent identity in the sequences of the amino acids. There's about 70% identity in the sequence of this protein and this protein, which is remarkable given the 600 million years of evolution that separate roundworms uh, from uh, vertebrates. So remarkable conservation of the protein. What's even more remarkable, I think, is the fact that the use to which the protein is put is um, the same. It's involved in uh, attracting axons to the bottom of the structure in both cases. So a remarkable degree of evolutionary conservation. So we can really think of the worm um, as a miniature spinal cord or the spinal cord as something of a worm, or as one person put it, the spinal cord is the worm within us. And when we discovered this evolutionary conservation, I think it came as a surprise, because up till then, I think it's fair to say that people thought that the mechanisms that are involved in wiring up our brain, our nervous system, which is so much more sophisticated, that those mechanisms would be more sophisticated than those that are involved in wiring up the nervous systems of simpler organisms. And this showed that that's not true. The very same building blocks are used to wire the nervous systems of roundworms, fruit flies, and vertebrates, the use to which these building block blocks um, uh, are put uh, is, of course, more sophisticated in the case of vertebrates. Now, we came across uh, uh, our identification of netrin led us to a second surprise, which is um, illustrated in the next slide, which came from studying the effect of netrin on individual growth cones. And here, what we did was to go back to uh, experiments like the one I showed you at the beginning, where um, individual growth cones are growing by themselves, and we presented a point source of netrin, a little glass micropipette, uh, from which netrin would diffuse. And we found that, sure enough, it functions as an attractant. Over a period of an hour, the axon will turn towards the source at the level of an individual growth cone. But the surprise came when we found that this was true for some neurons, some nerve cells. But we found other nerve cells in which netrin had exactly the opposite effect. That is, it served to repel them. So it was attractive to some, repulsive to others, and that's illustrated here, that netrins can attract some axons and can repel others. In fact, we've gone on uh, to show we understand the mechanistic basis of this. Um, there, for a growth cone to detect a protein like netrin, it has a sensor on its surface, another protein, uh, and the netrin binds to it in a lock and key fashion. It turns out there's one particular sensor that's used by neurons that are attracted. It stimulates an attractive response. There's a different sensor protein that's made by the nerve cells that are repelled. It stimulates a repulsive response. So attraction uh, and repulsion are in the eye of the beholder. This is true for growth cones just as it is for people. The, uh, this also came as a surprise because I think it's fair to say that at the time when we and others started uh, this kind of work, we thought that there would be dedicated attractive molecules and dedicated repulsive molecules. And this showed you that that was not the case, that molecules like netrins are two-faced. They're bifunctional. They can be attractive to some, repulsive to others. And it made us rethink how these, cue works, these cues work. And now we think of them more as signposts that indicate a direction in the case of the spinal cord, netrin ind indicates the direction of the bottom of the spinal cord. But how you interpret that directional information, of course, is up to you. You can be attracted, or if, you're, if you don't want to go to the bottom of the spinal cord, you might be repelled. It's a bit like when you're driving down the freeway. If there's a sign to the airport. If you want to go to the airport, you'll go in that direction. If you don't want to go to the airport, you'll turn in the opposite direction. So we think of these guidance cues now as signposts that can have the information, they provide information that can be interpreted in different ways by different growth cones. Now, uh, we were, of course, excited uh, to have found netrins. We were interested in identifying other chemoattractants. And I won't go through uh, the details, but suffice it to say uh, that we were able to identify a number of other um, uh, proteins that function as attractants for other classes of axons. And since then, the field has identified a number of others as well. So we have a number of the key players that are involved in attracting axons to their targets. We were also interested in identifying some of the molecules that are involved in stimulating the branching of axons. And again, emboldened by our, our uh, isolation of netrins, we decided to use the same approach of trying to reconstruct some of these branching phenomena in the rarefied environment of a petri dish and using them to 
identify some of the causal factors. And I'll just uh, summarize this very, very briefly. Um, we decided to focus on one class of nerve cells um, that uh, send their axons to a target where they branch extensively in the target. And we set up uh, an assay in a Petri dish where when the, we culture the neurons, they don't branch. But we found that if we took the target where they normally branch, ground it up, and applied it to the nerve cells, that it would stimulate the branching of the axons. And in the very same way, we were able from this extract to pinpoint the single protein that was responsible for this. It turned out to be a protein called SLIT, which by itself can stimulate the branching of these axons. So experiments like these then led us to identify proteins like the slits that stimulate the branching of axons. And again, uh, a wonderful convergence occurred because at the same time as we identified slits as branching factors, um, our friend and colleague at Berkeley, um, Corey Goodman, who works in fruit flies, was looking for a repellent factor um, and identified it as none other than a slit protein in the fly. And so this, um, uh, therefore, extended both of those themes. First of all, that these types of proteins can be bifunctional. There aren't dedicated branching factors. There are factors that can stimulate branching. They can also stimulate repulsion. And it turns out the slits can also stimulate attraction of yet other axons. And also this theme of evolutionary conservation, because the same molecules were involved in wiring the nervous system now in fruit flies as well as in uh, vertebrates. Now, others in the field then identified yet other repellents. There are two important families, uh, the semaphorins and the efferins. For the rest of the talk, I'd just like to refer to three of these protein families. And so I just want you to remember three of them. I'd like you to remember netrins as attractive factors. I'd like to, you to remember slits in their guise as repellents. And I'll also come back to the semaphorins at the very end of the talk as repellents. So what I've told you then um, is that the molecules that wire the brain include proteins like the netrins, the slits, and the others that I listed on the previous slide. That these cues, which we started off thinking would be dedicated to either attraction or repulsion or branching, are in fact multifunctional. They provide information that can be interpreted in different ways by different axons, and even often by the same axon at different stages. An axon can be attracted by netrin at the beginning and then repelled at later stages when it's grown older. And also, there's this remarkable evolutionary conservation of the mechanisms that are involved in wiring up the brain. So armed with this information, let's now turn to the challenge I mentioned earlier, which is the problem of long-range axon guidance. Um, remember, recall this corticospinal tract neuron, a neuron with its cell body in the cortex that sends an axon all the way down to the base of the spinal cord. And to give you an, an idea of the scale, the distance the axon has to go is about 100,000 times the diameter of the cell body. So if you remember back to that first snapshot I showed you of a neuron with its cell body and axon, imagine the axon growing 100,000 times the length. It's a bit, if the, the cell body were about a meter here, that would take you all the way to Sherbrooke. So it's a remarkable feat of navigation. And again, it can't be that there's just a chemo attractant at the base of the spinal cord. The distance is much too great. So how do axons accomplish these long-range navigational feats? Well, the way they do it, it turns out, is to take the complicated problem of long-range guidance and to divide it into a series of simpler tasks. They chop up their trajectory, if you will, into short segments. To grow from A to Z, you navigate points B, C, D, and so forth. And the distance from A to B is very short, from the starting point to an intermediate target, point B. And over each of those, inter those short segments, the mechanisms I've already described are at play. So, to grow from A to B, you're attracted to point B, again, a few hundred micrometers away, the distances over which the attractants can, can function. And then to grow from point B to point C, you're attracted to point C. But I think that you can see that this immediately raises a paradox. If the very first intermediate target, point B, is so attractive, when the axon gets there, why doesn't it stop there? Why, why does it move on? Why isn't it drawn back? And I've illustrated this here, if you imagine uh, a growth cone growing to its first intermediate target, an attractive intermediate target, when it gets there, why doesn't it stop? Why isn't it attracted back? Well, it turns out the reason um, axons can move on from these attractive intermediate targets is because the growth cone is a highly plastic machine that's designed so that when it touches the intermediate target, when it gets there, it switches the machinery so that it no longer perceives the environment as attractive, and instead it now perceives it as repulsive, which kicks it out 
onto the next leg of its trajectory. So you're attracted to that intermediate target, but then you switch and you're repelled. Attracted, repelled, attracted, repelled. And that's how an axon can navigate a very long distance. So what I'd like to do now is to tell you what we've learned about the mechanisms that are involved in switching from attraction to repulsion at intermediate targets. And to study this, we'll go back to a system we've been discussing so far, which is the spinal cord. And we're going to focus again on these commissural neurons, which I told you are attracted to the floor plate by netrin 1. What I didn't tell you is that the floor plate isn't their final destination. It's just an intermediate target. In fact, when the axons get there, what they do is to cross the midline at the floor plate, then they turn, they make a sharp right angle turn and project alongside the midline to other levels in the embryo, eventually leaving the midline to reach their final destinations. And the distances are quite great. Some of these neurons will start axons here in the spinal cord and their axons will grow all the way up to the brain. So it's a very nice example of long range axon guidance through a series of intermediate targets, the first of which is the floor plate. Now, uh, a more convenient way of visualizing this crossing and turning of the axons involves opening up the spinal cord at the top. The, as you might have seen in that picture of the chick embryo, um, the, the spinal cord is a tube. There's actually a cavity here. It's normally compressed. Uh, but we can open it up and flatten it out like a book, like this, and visualize the axons from above. So what I've told you is that these neurons face two challenges. They have to get to the midline. But once they get there, they have to enter the midline, cross the midline, leave the midline, and move on to the next leg of their trajectory. And so the question I'd like to address now is, why did the growth cone cross the midline? <laughs> and before I address that, I'd first like to show you what this, this crossing and turning looks like. Jim Wong, a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, has set up an assay recently uh, in which you can take up pieces of embryonic rat spinal cord, label the nerve cells with a dye, and then visualize the dye. And here's a movie of this. You can see the axons growing up to the floor plate, crossing, turning, and then projecting alongside the midline, just as I've shown in this cartoon here. This is, um, happens over about 14 hours. Let me show you the movie one more time. Uh, focus down here on some of these growth cones. You can see that they're actively probing the environment, saying, do I go up, do I go down? And eventually, all of them will turn in the right direction. Again, just illustrating how directed the growth of these axons is. So how do growth cones navigate the midline? Well, first getting there, I've already told you, they get there because they're attracted by attractants like netrin-1. But then we have this paradox. If they're so attracted, why don't they stall out there? How can they possibly move on? And I've already told you the solution. The reason they can move on is because the midline, in addition to making attractants, also makes repellents. And the way it works is this, that initially, the axons are insensitive to the repellents. That enables them to enter the midline, cross the midline. But then, through mechanisms that are still actually rather poorly understood, they dramatically switch on their responsiveness to the repellents. They do this by activating the sensor protein for the repellent, for the slit protein here. I've indicated this by this blue to brown transition. And now, sensing the repellent, it kicks them out onto the next leg of their trajectory. I'd, I'd like to just show you one piece of evidence to try to convince you that the reason axons move on is because they switch on responsiveness to the repellents. If this model is correct, what we predict is this, that if we could reduce the amount of repulsion they experience, either by getting rid of some of the repellents themselves, the slits, or by getting rid of the sensor for the repellent, the neurons should be less effectively ex expelled and basking in the attractive substance here, they should stall out at a high frequency. And so that is indeed what happens. And let me just illustrate this. Again, for this, we did this, this work in the mouse embryo. So the idea is they switch on repulsion. Um, we did this in the mouse embryo. And uh, here you see just the normal crossing and turning of the axons. I showed you a movie um, in the previous slide. Um, here, what we've done is to just put a little bit of a, a dye here, which is diffused down the axons. And again, you see this beautiful crossing and turning of the axons. This is what normally happens. But now let's look at a mouse in which we've inactivated the sensor for the repellent so that the axons no longer experience that repulsion. Then what we find is this, that the axons stall out at very high frequency in the midline. And this is consistent with the idea that the reason they normally move on 
is because they're repelled. So moving on involves switching on repulsion. Now, if you think about it, for this mechanism to work effectively, it's going to be important not just to switch on repulsion. You also have to switch off the attraction that got you there in the first place. Because if you continue to be attracted, the growth cone would uh, undergo a tug of war, where it's being kicked out by the repellent and drawn back by the attractant. And sure enough, when these axons cross the midline, not only do they switch on repulsion, they also switch off their ability to sense the attractive netrin down here. And um, what we've discovered is the mechanism through which the attractive response gets switched off. And it turns out that switching off attraction is actually caused by the switching on of repulsion. When the axon becomes sensitive, activates the sensor for the slip protein, not only does it kick the axon out, that sensor also functions to switch off the attractive effect of netrin. And we discovered this causal relationship, that the switching on of repulsion causes the switching off of attraction, in tissue culture experiments again, where we were studying the responses of individual growth cones to netrin protein, again, this beautiful turn towards netrin, but then asked, what happens if we bathe the nerve cell in slit protein? And the answer is, it switches off the attractive effect of netrin. So when slit protein is presented in a point source, it repels. When it's presented uniformly, it no longer repels. There's no directionality. But it actually switches off the attraction. And the way this works, it turns out mechanistically, is that the slit sensor actually physically grabs on to the sensor for the attractive netrin protein and switches it off. So moving on involves becoming repelled and switching off attraction. And the behavior of growth cones at the midline is therefore reminiscent of some human relationships in which, sadly, uh, an initial attraction or infatuation can be destabilized by a growing repulsion that not only pushes the two people apart, but if it becomes intense enough, it can actually erase all memory of the initial attraction <laughs> so that the parties move on. So we can think of axon guidance from one intermediate target to the next to the next as an example of serial monogamy, <laughs> although in the case of axons, there's typically a happy ending since most of them will find a synaptic partner with which to form a lasting relationship. <laughs> so how do axons navigate long distances? Well, the logic is that they navigate from one intermediate target to the next to the, to the next, and this requires this remarkable plasticity where the growth cone is first attracted, then switches to becoming repelled, attracted, repelled, attracted, repelled. So now I'd like to close by asking whether this information that we have about how the nervous system gets wired up during embryonic development might be useful in attempts to repair the nervous system following injury. And again, up till now, we've talked about the development of connections where neurons send axons out that are guided to their targets through the combined action of attractants that provide a pull and repellents that provide a push or that can also hem axons in to specific corridors. When neurons reach their targets, of course, the growth cone will stop being this motile structure and will settle down to form what's called a presynaptic terminal, a terminal that's now static, that stays on the, the target cell, as shown here. What happens when axons are injured, and again, let's go back to spinal cord injury, where traumatic injury can lead to the cutting, the severing of the axons that link the brain to the spinal cord. What happens is that the axon will actually immediately reform a growth cone like the one that was present in the embryo. This is remarkable if you think about it. Um, take a 70-year-old um, whose axons have been static for 70 years. If there's an injury, within minutes to hours, they reform growth cones. They reactivate a developmental program. So there's a developmental program that's latent in all of these axons that can be reactivated by injury. Now, in your arms and legs, in what's known as the peripheral nervous system, the growth cones reform and they can actually regrow back to their targets. So axons might be severed, for example, by a laceration wound, but the axons can actually grow back more or less well to their targets and you can get functional recovery. That's why, for example, if someone has their finger cut off, it can be reconnected and it would remain paralyzed, 
except that the axons that have been cut can grow back in and reconnect to the muscle cells that are required for movement. That's true in your arms and legs. Tragically, it's not true in the brain or spinal cord, the so-called central nervous system. There, when axons are cut, they reform growth cones, but they are frustrated and fail to move forward. They stall out. Now, this isn't universally true. In cold-blooded vertebrates, like amphibians and fishes, the axons that reform in the spinal cord can regrow. In a goldfish, for example, if you sever axons, they can actually regrow, just like the nerves in our arms and legs. But in warm-blooded vertebrates, in birds and in mammals, including primates, including humans, when axons are severed, they reform growth cones, but the axons fail to progress. Now, it turns out that they fail to progress not because they're completely incapable of growth. They are actually capable of growth. And this was actually uh, shown uh, almost 30 years ago now by Albert Aguayo uh, and his colleagues here at the Montreal General Hospital in McGill. And I see Albert uh, in the audience here. I hope you'll be uh, uh, you'll um, uh, engage him in conversation uh, after the, the seminar. Albert demonstrated that axons in the brain and spinal cord actually fail to regrow, not because they're incapable of growth, but because the environment is hostile to regrowth, which I've indicated by these little minus signs here. And the, the way he showed this in brief was to uh, provide the, the nerve cells with an environment that was more permissive and show they could actually grow through that permissive environment. So the fact that they don't grow isn't because they're incapable of growth, it's because they are frustrated and inhibited. And so, a, uh, and there are, in fact, regrowth inhibitors that block axon regrowth in the spinal cord. So what we're interested in, of course, is to ask whether we can use the information that I've described to restore the ability for nerve growth in the spinal cord in the brain following injury. And the approach that the field is taking, our lab and other labs, is multi-pronged. The idea is to try to get axons to regrow by providing stimulators of growth, perhaps proteins like the netrins, to try to neutralize the inhibitors. If we could identify these minus signs here and then block them, perhaps we could get the axons to regrow. Another approach um, is based on um, uh, this finding that the growth cone is a machine that can switch its response from attraction to repulsion. It can also switch its response from repulsion to attraction. So we can ask, what if we could get the growth cones to still see these minuses, but no longer see them as inhospitable. And the reason I bring this up is because there's evidence that this might be possible. Again, this comes from uh, these types of experiments in tissue culture, where you may recall at the beginning, I asked you to remember a family of proteins called the semaphorins uh, that function as repellents. Well, here you see uh, a growth cone responding to a semaphorin called semaphorin 3A or sema 3A. You can see it's repelled. And it turns out that we can get into the mind of the growth cone, we can get it to switch from repulsion to attraction using a very simple chemical approach. The, the precise approach doesn't matter to you. For those of you who are specialists, it's a very simple drug, 8-bromocyclic GMP, but the identity doesn't matter. The point is, we can flick this switch so that the growth cone sees the semaphore and no longer as repulsive, but rather sees it as attractive. If you will, what we're doing is we're giving the growth cone rose-colored glasses. And so, the idea here would be a third approach would be to not get rid of the inhibitors, but convert the response from repulsion to attraction. And lastly, the final approach that people are using is to try to increase the number of shots on goal. I told you about branching factors that can make axons branch. Well, if we add branching factors so that the neuron no longer has a single growth cone, but has multiple growth cones, this hydra-like structure, that gives the neuron more opportunities to try to reconnect. So what people are trying is combinations of these different approaches to try to affect neural repair. And I'd just like to close by showing you some of the progress that we've made in identifying at least one of the factors that we believe is important uh, that functions as a break on regeneration, one of these minus signs, if you will. It turns out to be um, a member of this very same family of proteins, the semaphorins. And, and let me just show you the experimental system in which we've studied this which is, again, the corticospinal tract projection, the neurons that project from the cortex down the spinal cord. And the way we study this is shown here. This shows you the nervous system of a rat, its brain and spinal cord. We perform an injury in the spinal cord. And then six weeks later, uh, and of course, the injury will cut the axons. Six weeks later, we inject a tracer dye that traces the axons. We can cut out a piece of the spinal cord and then examine it under a microscope at high magnification. And what you see is this that a scar will form where the injury was. 
And here you see the labeled axons. You can see the bits that are here. You can see that they um, are right up against the scar, but none of them have crossed the scar. They failed to regenerate. And this is the failure of regeneration that was documented, for example, by Ramon y Cajal 100 years ago uh, in the spinal cord. So a failure to regenerate. Well, what we found is that one of these semaphorins, one of these inhibitory factors, is actually very highly made by the scar tissue. And so it's a candidate for one of these molecules that are preventing regrowth. The, se the sensor for SEMA3F is actually found on the axons. And so we can ask, what if we interfere with the action of this inhibitory molecule? And we did that by blocking the sensor on the axons. And when, what we see, then, is in fact evidence of regeneration. Here's, if we look at high magnification, we can see axons crossing the lesion site here. Uh, in this first animal, here's uh, another example of axons crossing the lesion site, something that we never normally see. And again, we're seeing it because we've gotten rid of the sensor for SEMA3F. The axons no longer sense this repellent molecule. And these types of data then are encouraging us to think that it would be possible to identify some of the key inhibitory molecules in the spinal cord, block their action in, turn, in order to um, encourage repair. And so this brings me back to Ramon y Cajal, because Cajal was not just the discoverer of the growth cone, the proponent of the chemotropic theory. He was also one of the first great students of the development of the degeneration and regeneration of the nervous system. And in fact, he summarized his findings, like the failure of regeneration in the spinal cord, in his classic treatise called Degeneration and Regeneration of the Nervous System in 1913. Um, uh, a number of years, seven years after he won the Nobel Prize. Uh, and I'd just like to read uh, from this treatise. Um, after witnessing the failure of regeneration in the central nervous system, Cajal expressed this pessimistic thought that the functional specialization of the brain imposes on the neurons two great lacunae, two great challenges, if you will. Proliferative inability, the, the fact that new nerve cells aren't made, you, uh, the number of nerve cells that you have late in life is the number that you started with, except those that you've lost. And irreversibility of intraprotoplasmic differentiation, meaning that axons can't regrow. It's for this reason that once the development was ended, the founts of growth and regeneration of the axons and dendrites dried up irrevocably. In adult centers, the nerve paths are something fixed, ended, immutable. Everything may die, nothing may be regenerated. Now, this is a very pessimistic conclusion, but Cajal was actually an optimist at heart, and he concluded in the ne very next paragraph, he continued with this exhortation to future generations, that it's for the science of the future to change, if possible, this harsh decree. Inspired with high ideals, it must work to impede or moderate the gradual decay of the neurons, to overcome the almost invincible rigidity of their connections, and to reestablish nor normal nerve paths when disease has severed centers that were intimately associated. Well, I hope that the last few slides I've shown you have convinced you that in this more optimistic prediction, as in so many of other, his other predictions, Cajal was right on the money. <laughs> and in closing, I'd like to acknowledge the many collaborators, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows uh, in my laboratory. I put their names on the slides as I went along. Also acknowledge the many uh, collaborators in other laboratories um, uh, who, with whom we've interacted very closely. And last but not least, I'd like to thank the people who are involved in the dissection of 25,000 embryonic chick brains, uh, <laughs> members of the laboratory, rotation students, friends, and even family. Thank you very much. I'm just going to close the laptop. <laughs> uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bruce Dobby, and I'm president of the McGill Alumni Association. And on behalf of all of us at McGill, I'd like to thank Dr. Tessie Levine for his fascinating presentation and for being a driving force in the field of scientific research. Wilder Penfield once said, the brain is the organ of destiny. It holds within its humming mechanism secrets that will determine the future of the human race. There is no doubt, Mark, that we are all in awe of your neurological research and your ability to enlighten us today in, in these secrets of the brain with both your, are both refreshing and inspiring. 
Uh, in my first year dental school, um, we studied uh, the development of the cells and the development of the brain. And um, if you had been there, and we had talked about dogs walking and dating, you know, two things would have happened. I would have uh, remembered a lot and I would have stayed awake. <laughs> so on behalf of everybody here, I'd uh, like to thank, at this point, I'm, I normally say I'd like to give you a small token of our appreciation, but today, we have a large token of appreciation. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. As Principal Monroe Bloom stated earlier, this, this year marks the 75th anniversary of the Montreal Neurological Institute. To celebrate this milestone, I would like to introduce Dr. David Coleman, the director of the MNI and holder of the Penfield Chair in Neuro Neuroscience at McGill, to moderate our question period. Dr. Coleman and his team conduct wide-ranging research in the areas of ranging from spinal cord injuries to the development and regeneration of cells. He has made major contributions to our understanding of how nerves are, are protected and nurtured in the brain and in the peripheral and nervous systems. Most recently, his work led to the discovery of the novel ways by which the nerve cells communicate with each other. Dr. Coleman completed his Bachelor of Science at, at New York University and obtained a PhD uh, in neuroscience at the State University of New York. Before coming to McGill in 2002, Dr. Coleman served as the Annenberg Professor of Micro Molecular Biology and Neuroscience as well as the Vice Chairman for Research in the, de in the de Department of Neurology and Scientific Director of the Corrine Goldsmith Dickinson Center at the Mount Sinai Center of Medicine in New York. He has received numerous prestigious awards and is on the editorial board of several scientific journals and is a member of the scientific board of international foundations and societies dedicated to finding cures for nervous systems and diseases such as multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease. To moderate our question period, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. David Coleman. So um, you can see from my CV that I'm perfectly qualified to run the question and answer period. <laughs> Uh, first thing, I'd like to thank Mark for explaining what to me is unexplainable. So I think we should give him another round of applause. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and now we'll take questions from the audience. Please use the microphone and um, make your question a question and uh, not a political statement and also uh, make it brief. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Dr. Tessier, I wonder if you could offer some clarification of a seeming paradox uh, concerning scientific endeavors today. On the one hand, the wondrous complexity of the brain seems to attract some of our best and most devoted minds. But on the other hand, the greater the knowledge gained, the worse the repulsion seems to be in effect between the gap of the public and the scientific community. As we see the loss of support, the general illiteracy, scientific illiteracy, and the fact that fewer students are entering scientific endeavors today than in the past. And so my question really concerns the notion of branching. How can we improve the branching between the scientific community and the general population? Well, the, I, I, I think that's a very fair question. I, I think the, the, the starting point, of course, is communication. I think that uh, scientists have to be willing to take the time to communicate um, what they're doing and the importance of what they're doing. And uh, you know, scientists have many pressures on them, especially in, in tough economic times, you know, getting grant support, funding for their laboratories, uh, trying to publish their findings and so forth. And it's difficult for them to find the time always to do that. Uh, and, but it's important that they do that. I think that the scientists have, to, uh, scientists have to be their own best friends. They can be their own worst enemies if they don't 
um, actually go out and explain, present to the public why it is that the support is necessary. Now, this falls on scientists in general. It falls especially on the leadership of the scientific community, uh, people like David, for example, who spend a lot of their time um, uh, trying to communicate this. And in fact, I was very impressed yesterday uh, discussing with David the campaign that they've developed recently to try to bring le neuro, uh, the neuro, to um, the general population here. I think that's essential. I think uh, often as scientists, when we're trained, we're, um, uh, we don't realize that, that this is an in integral part of our job. So there's a responsibility on the part of the scientists. There's a responsibility also on the part of politicians and public servants. I think that uh, uh, we all understand that it's scientific discovery, especially in our societies, that will fuel economic growth. And uh, I think that scientists have to uh, convey that, but uh, we also need the help of politicians as well. Next question, please. <laughs> <clears throat> so, Dr. Tessier, you mentioned in your lecture that uh, uh, cold-blooded vertebrates can regenerate severed central nervous <coughs> connections, but not warm-blooded vertebrates like us. Uh, so that uh, I wonder that at some point it must have been found a disadvantage for warm-blooded vertebrates to regenerate severed central nervous connections. Can you speculate why this might be so? Right. So, so why don't we regenerate our spinal cords or, or our brains? Uh, and uh, I, that's a great question. Of course, no one knows the answer to, to this, to these types of evolutionary questions. But I think everybody's best speculation is that as the nervous system became more and more complex and sophisticated, that it was important for the nervous system to clamp down on plasticity, um, that you didn't want nerve cells just sprouting willy-nilly. Uh, your memories would get fuzzy, uh, if you will. And, uh, uh, and that as a result, the nervous system has clamped down so plasticity is very, very tightly controlled in the nervous system. It happens in very specific locations in the brain where there are rearrangements. Now, what's been discovered over the past 20 years, and again, you know, starting with the, the work uh, that Albert did in the spinal cord, um, was to find that there is actually more plasticity than we thought. It's not quite as invincible. The, the rigidity is not as invincible as Cajal uh, held it. But it's very tightly controlled. And so the assumption, it's sort of a, a teleological um, assumption, is that um, it was necessary to do this in order for the nervous system to perform at higher and higher levels. Now, the only way, uh, how could one test this experimentally? The, the only way I've thought that one might be able to do that is if we can identify some of the molecular mechanisms that are responsible for controlling that plasticity, then take them away in an experimental organism like the mouse through this kind, these kinds of genetic tricks and make a mouse that could regenerate its spinal cord like a goldfish and ask, is memory in that mouse less good than in a normal mouse? You know, does its nervous system function um, less well? Uh, so I think one can look forward to those types of experiments once we have a better handle on what the mechanisms are that clamp down on plasticity. But it's a great question, uh, and no one really knows the answer to it yet. Next. The uh, previous questioner asked my question. Thank you. <laughs> great. Uh -huh. Same answer. <laughs> Um, this question is regarding the last experiment where you showed us the regeneration of um, spinal, curriculospinal axons. I was wondering whether there was a um, behavioral um, result. Oh, that, that's a, a great question. We haven't yet looked at behavior in these animals. What we've, what we've done, I showed you the outcome of a long study where we, we took lots of genetically engineered mice that lack various um, guidance cues, like the netrins or the sensors. Um, uh, and performed lesions to ask whether in any of them we could see enhanced repair, and this was the winner. Now that we have it, in terms of anatomical repair, we're just starting to look at behavior, but we don't have those results yet. Okay. Good morning. A question uh, relating to brain tumor. Uh, this theory of repellent and attraction of the axonal growth in malignant brain tumor, does, is this a way of perhaps treating um, the malignancy, uh, at, at, sorry, manipulation of, of, of a drug that right. would perhaps attract or repel. Right, so in, in brain tumors, what happens, of course, um, is that some cells in the brain, <clears throat> typically not nerve cells, although that can happen, but some of these support cells <clears throat> start forming tumors. They start multiplying mm -hmm. uh, indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it's clear that some of the tumor cells can respond to these kinds of guidance cues. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of them can repel tumor cells. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the, the guidance cues uh, don't really kill the tumor cells, which is ultimately what you want to do. So although you could perhaps channel the tumor cells in a particular direction, uh, I think people are focused more on therapies that are actually, uh, that, that can lead to the killing of, of the tumor cells. And that's where uh, we have a big program at Genentech, for example, focused on brain tumors. That's where we're putting our efforts. Not that I don't love the axon guidance molecules and wouldn't use them if we thought they'd be useful, but we think that uh, 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 substances that actually kill the tumor cells are going to be more valuable to the patient. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a question going back to the guidance, and you were talking about how the netrons at the intermediary point shift from being attractive to repulsive. What is it about the end destination that modulates the fact that they no longer shift, and can we change their minds about that? Oh, that's a great question. So there must be some signal when you get to the target that says, time to stop. Right. And in fact, the growth cone, which is so motile, will actually shut down right, and stop moving. There has to be a signal or signals there that do that. The molecular identity of those signals is not known present. So there are big, big unanswered questions in this field, including that one. Uh, and I agree with you. If we can understand that, maybe if we can understand how that shuts down the growth cone, maybe we can use that information again to switch on growth cones again to affect repair. But for those of you who are thinking about what they want to do with their second career, I do want to point out that there are, again, great unanswered questions, and it's a wonderful time to be entering this field to try to push the, the knowledge uh, forward further. Yes. Thank you. I have a question which I will read on behalf of the young lady sitting beside me, and the reason I'm reading it will become apparent. Uh, she says, I have a question about the treatment for cranial cervical dystonia, and so we'll get into a clinical application, which has lasted so far for four and a half years in an otherwise healthy 68-year-old lady. Uh, besides chronic and debilitating neck pain, the illness has resulted in almost complete loss of voice. Loss of focus? Voice. Voice. Voice, voice. I see. Okay. The, okay. Now, this illness is believed to involve the basal ganglia within the brainstem. Genetically, it is thought to resemble the GYT6 genotype, but we don't have actual genetic testing results. My question, part one, is does your lab do genetic testing relating to certain neurological disorders? And secondly, knowing the genotype, would this help in creating a more appropriate plan of treatment? Thank you. So the, um, first, I'm sorry to hear about um, this lady's uh, condition. Um, the, the, in terms of the specific question, uh, we don't actually do genetic testing in our laboratory. Um, our company is part of a larger group, the Roche Group, uh, and we have actually a, a whole unit uh, called Roche Diagnostics that's focused on uh, developing diagnostics for a variety of disorders, including neurological um, disorders. So. That is uh, an area both within our company, but also more generally in the field. Uh, the question of whether diagnosing the, the, uh, the basis of the disorder could be helpful, the, the, to my mind, the, the short answer is yes. I think that it's always valuable to know that information. Knowing that information doesn't necessarily lead immediately to a treatment or to a cure, but it's the best way of being able to match the, the, the disorder to um, the expanding body of knowledge um, that's happening right now uh, in, in the field of neurological uh, disorders. So uh, I think it's, it's definitely worth getting the genotype, but whether that will lead immediately to an application uh, really depends on the particular condition. And I have to say I'm not familiar with this particular um, uh, disorder, so I, I can't really comment on that. Again, I know there, there's some neurologists here in the audience who might be able to do that. Uh, better, but I'd be happy to be talk to talk about it at greater length uh, after two, the questions. Two more questions. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Great talk. Really appreciate it, Mark. Um, any application implication of these discoveries in other neurological conditions like Alzheimer's stroke, where really regeneration or, or uh, uh, neural function seems to be very much at play? Right. So uh, the this whole field of trying to get axons to regrow um, the the. The, the first place where many of us focus our efforts and, and where the implications are obvious is spinal cord injury. Um, but you're absolutely right, there are other areas. Uh, so stroke, for example. Um, now stroke, as you know, is caused uh, typically by an occlusion of a blood vessel so that nerve cells fail to get the oxygen they need to survive. Um, and uh, so they will die off. And there are waves of, of cell death. 
Um, and that's a first set of problems. And to tackle stroke, you want to tackle those first and foremost. But when the damage has been done, the nerve cells that remain try to reconnect. And if you could encourage that plasticity, you might be able to regain more function. It's very clear in stroke patients that through exercise, through physical therapy, through using the circuits, that they can entrain them and strengthen them. And if we could provide some chemical assistance to that, um, uh, that would be valuable. And these types of uh, approaches might be useful for that as well. So other types of injury beyond spinal cord injury might be amenable. In neurodegenerative disease, um, the, again, the first thing you want to do first and foremost is to block the degeneration. Right? But it could be useful also to take advantage of the connections that remain. And again, restorative therapies of the kind that can emerge from the type of science I described today might be useful as an adjunct. Again, you, to, you, to go to the, for the jugular, you want to go for the nerve cell death and slow that or block it. And that's where, you know, that's where we, for example, at Genentech are placing a lot of our efforts as well. So there could be applications, um, but uh, in the context of other therapies as well. Thank you very much for a fascinating uh, a talk. Um, I was thinking that the picture that emerges from, from this is that uh, the structure of the brain may be in fact uh, encoded or a blueprint for it is provided by these intricate signposts that essentially will eventually guide the uh, development of, the, of the, all the neurons. And you, you said that there would be about a trillion of them. So this uh, raises the question of what guides the placement of these uh, signposts in such an intricate, uh, unbelievably intricate pattern uh, which complexity is in fact larger than the complexity of the brain itself because you know they have to you know interact and uh, provide these intricate paths yeah. so what what could be uh, laying down that blueprint in well, place that, that's a great question so the the I talked about how nerve cells react to signposts once they've been placed there but obviously someone something has to place them there and and what's happening is that as the brain develops the the nerve cells form. Um, there are other cells around the nerve cells, support cells, that also help provide structure to the brain. Cells like the, the ones at the, the, the bottom of the spinal cord, those yellow floor plate cells. And um, those cells make the cues. They have to be programmed to make the cues. So the floor plate cells have contained within them a genetic program for making netrin protein, for example. And something, actually, even at earlier stages, has to make floor plate cells. So they're, initially, there are cells that are undifferentiated, unspecialized. And other cells nearby make a signal that triggers those non-specialized cells to become floor plate cells. We actually know a lot about that kind of what uh, developmental biologists talk about that is patterning of tissues. Um, so you, pattern, you start with. Uh, uh, uncommitted cells, and you get them to commit to a particular fate, like floor plate fate. We know a lot about the mechanisms that are involved in that. There are cascades of conversations between cells where relatively unspecialized cells will talk to one another, and the conversation becomes more and more intricate with signals going back and forth, and then genetic programs within the cells building up further and further. This is a problem that's, that's important not just for the nervous system. It's true for any organ in your body. You know, how do you go from the embryonic limb to this fully differentiated arm with you know, digits. Uh, there are complex programs where initially all of our, limb, our hands are webbed, uh, and then the cells in between the digits in us, but not in ducks, will die off. Right? So there are programs at play there to sculpt tissues and organs to make sure that cues are displayed in just the right way. And it's a very, very careful choreography. Right? If this, the cues come up too late, the axons will have Misrouted, so it's really remarkable this, this whole the symphony of dev development, uh, if you will. Everything has to fit in place. We focused on one segment, which is when the cues are theirs, what are they, and how the axons respond. But as you point out, there's everything that comes before and everything that comes after. Well, Mark, thanks for a wonderful talk. Thank you. <clears throat> So I, I want to thank you all for coming, and um, 
uh, and also asking terrific questions. I'd like to thank the Office of Development and Alumni Relations at McGill University, the Office of the Vice Principal for Research and International Affairs, the BD Lecture Committee, and all my colleagues at the MNI, the McGill Alumni Association, and especially my colleague Beth Coffrin, who really managed this this morning. Thanks very much. And have a great rest of the weekend.